You're listening to Market Champions, a podcast on navigating the financial markets. Here's your host, Shravasa Prakash. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. I just wanted to remind you to like, subscribe, and leave a comment. Really helps the page grow, really helps the podcast grow. Thank you so much for your support. And now on to the interview. Hey guys, welcome back to another episode of Market Champions. Today, we've got Jerry Parker, the CEO of Chesapeake Capital. He was also one of the most legendary traders. Uh, sorry, he was one of the, he was one of the group of the most legendary traders, the turtle traders. So thank you so much for being on the podcast, Jerry. It's awesome to have you here. Well, thanks for having me, Sharif. So Jerry, uh, tell the audience a little bit about your background, how you got started in case, you know, someone may not know where you know where you're from. So I grew up in Virginia and I majored in accounting and I knew and immediately when I was working in the accounting field that I wanted to do something else. And so I was interested in stocks and trading and I just had the opportunity to read a lot of books and uh, magazines and newsletters and preparing myself for something better and bigger. And I learned about trend following on my own. I saw the ad in the Wall Street Journal for Richard Dennis. Uh, they were gonna, it was uh, the fall of 1983. They were going to hire uh, people, teach them how to trade, give them money to trade. And I thought, yes, this is a very good idea for me. I had come across Richard Dennis in Business Week magazine or something like that. And so I knew that he was legitimately a trader, a smart person, someone who had made $200 million supposedly uh, trading. So I thought that this was a really good idea for me. I mean, I didn't even remember really looking at the, wall, the one ads in the Wall Street Journal. But so it was a lot of uh, good fortune for me. And so I sent my resume in and uh, they sent out uh, a true false test. So I think they said there were 1000 people who applied and they sent out 1000 true false tests, 100 true false questions. And I carried this around with me going to, uh, you know, business audits and company audits while I was doing my regular job for as long as I could. I finally sent it in and they called me up and they gave me an interview. And I went to Chicago and got the interview and got the job. And uh, it's just like all the stories. We had a two or three week class uh, teaching us how to trade and how to uh, think about the markets and math and statistics. And then January, 1984, we got a million dollars and started trading, uh, trying to follow the rules that we've been given. And that uh, program was very successful. I think most years, most people were making about 200% a year. Wow. And then it lasted four years. And in uh, February, 1988, um, I sort of, uh, went off on my own and started Chesapeake Capital. And Chesapeake Capital is still around today, managing um, about $100 million. But our peak assets were two and a half billion at one point. <laughs> All uh, commodities, currencies, stocks and bonds, long and short, uh, trend following. So it's been quite a, a ride for 37 years. Yeah. It's, it, it, that's, uh, you know, that's absolutely amazing. And do you remember, you know, what sort of separated you from, you know, the other 1000 people that applied for the job? Do you remember, like, do you remember anything that, you know, specifically from the interview or you know, from the sure and false questions that, you know, sort of made you stand out? Yeah, good question. Um, you know, I, f I went up for the interview and I filled my head with so many uh, facts about trading and trends that I was like probably worthless in this interview. Um, they were perfectly happy to hire people with uh, some sort of uh, unique background, uh, but with little knowledge, but just the ability to learn and uh, be willing to follow the rules. But I think during the interview, my, uh, you know, Rich told me, he said, well, we, I wanted to hire you because you said something like, well, I'll become a trader with or without you. And so that's just a typical kind of macho, stupid thing <laughs> for a 25-year-old to say. You're not even 25 yet. So uh, 
you know, that's just sort of, you know, bragging or being ridiculously bold. And, but, you know, he, he kind of liked it, I guess. And um, so that was a good moment for me to hear that and just to show passion and desire. And I really wanted the job. Um, and then I had, I thought trend following was great. And I had learned a lot on my own and everything I learned about, you know, trading, I just thought it was great. I mean, leverage, yeah, perfect. Uh, shorts, yes, shorts, I mean, you know, you're gonna get uh, short trends and then currencies and commodities, uh, you know, just like today, most people, when they talk about trading, it's all about stocks. But I thought, yeah, mm -hmm. more diversification. And I was 25 and, and sort of self-teaching. And I thought all of these things were wonderful. And uh, so I was well prepared for a good opportunity. Um, and I did well on the test. And so they told me that I had the highest score out of a thousand people. Wow. So that's probably, honestly, you know, what happened was they wanted to hire a couple people who did really well on the test and they were perfectly happy to hire qualified people who did poorly on the test, who had just not, uh, you know, spent as much time as I had thinking and reading about trend following. Was the test like purely just about trading or? It was about trading. Um, it was about psychology, you know, like it takes money to make money, true or false. Uh, a trader should love their losses, true or false. Mm -hmm. uh, markets have a tendency to trend, true or false. So some of the questions were very easy and some of them were um, more, you had to think a little bit. Um, I think the test actually made it out there. Someone has a copy of it, I believe, somewhere. And so I think if you Googled it, you could probably find those questions. Got it. Got it. And, you know, you say you weren't even 25 when you got into the program. So were you one of the youngest people there or, you know, were other people the same age as you? Yeah, most of the people, uh, you know, Curtis Faith was pretty famous and he has written a book or so. And he was 17 and uh, he got the job and he was very good from the very beginning. And so he didn't stay around trading as long as me. Uh, but I was very poor at the very beginning. So, but he had the, uh, a much better ability from the uh, get-go to follow the rules and um, understand and sort of figure out what they really wanted. We had good training and sufficient um, structure, but I think it did take a little bit to sort of figure out the politics of the room and what were they really after and some of the things that they said they didn't like, they ended up liking and vice versa. So mm -hmm. it was, uh, you know, quite a, quite a great experience. Got it. And how have sort of markets evolved, you know, from, you know, when Richard Dennis taught the original turtles to how they are today? What's changed? Well, one thing that's changed a lot is risk tolerance. We had, uh, you know, a very low risk tolerance. <laughs> or high risk tolerance, you know, we were trying to make 200% a year, but that's mm -hmm. really not something that clients uh, can handle, the volatility associated with that. But I think a couple of things have happened to the markets themselves. And um, <clears throat> one is more markets and that's great. Uh, we traded 20 markets, you know, maybe like uh, five grains, five currencies, uh, one stock index, a couple of bonds, silver and gold, crude and heating oil and uh, coffee and sugar, something mm -hmm. like that. And then now we trade a hundred markets. Uh, so 20 commodities, 20, at least 20 currencies, 20 interest rates, as many stocks as you want, uh, lots of metals and energy. So it's really changed a lot and that's great. That's what a trend follower really needs is more markets uh, to try to dampen the volatility and increase the potential for the, you know, we were going to make all of our money on five or 10% of the trades, uh, the big outlier moves. And so we need um, more markets. And then now we have crazy markets, Bitcoin, um, emissions, uh, markets I've never heard of before and I know nothing about. So, but I, I think, I guess the, the negative is that the markets are, harder, there's more people, there's more computers and back testing and uh, more trend followers. 
And so I think the markets are choppier and uh, you have to be longer term and sit through bigger drawdowns now. So I think the trend following can work. It does work. It's worked wonderful. I've seen, I, I think over the last six months, it's been better than I've ever seen it before. Um, but the drawdowns are you know, still an issue with lots of volatility now. Right. And, you know, has the behavior of markets as a whole, you know, changed or do markets behave sort of similar to how they did in the 1980s? You know, in the 1980s, we didn't have as many hedge funds as we do today. And, you know, today we saw, we don't have, say, the bank prop trading desks that we did, you know, back then. So. Well, I think, like I said, it's choppier. It's harder to stay in the trend. I think the trends end violently sometimes. Although I remember quite a bit of violence <laughs> in the 80s and the 90s as well, and crazy moves and crashes. So I'm not so sure about that. Um, but certainly over the last 10 or 12 years, the zero interest rate policy and Fed intervention has, had, um, has been blamed for the lack of trends except in the stocks and the bonds. So over half our portfolio would be currencies and commodities. And so we've suffered, uh, maybe that's what's to blame, but uh, maybe hopefully that's changing and commodities have started to do really well recently. Um, yeah, I think it's hard to say. I wouldn't put a lot of emphasis on changes. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, when I do research and look at data and do a back test, I use all of the data. I go all the way back as far as I can, the 70s or the 80s. And so I sort of ignore, I guess really, uh, if the markets have changed, I ignore it. I mm -hmm. devise my rules and my systems to use all the data. Whatever has worked the best over all the data from the 80s through 2020, that's what I, that's the data I use. So I think that's probably better uh, than trying to use less data. Got it. And, you know, quants technically, they, uh, they usually split the data into sort of in sample versus out of sample. So do you, do you do that kind of thing or do you sort of just put all the data into one sample test? Yes, I do one sample test. I'm always looking for as much data. Mm -hmm. And really, the, um, from what I was taught, um, one of the biggest issues with trading, especially trend following, is sample size. How many historical trades are you looking at? <clears throat> so I don't think you want to split the data when the outcome may be you have fewer trades to look at. I don't understand the benefit of in sample, out of sample. Um, look at all the data, see what works the best. I tend not to get too um, detailed about trying to hone in on the very best parameter. Mm -hmm. uh, and I trade a broad range. I don't trade the best thing that worked in the back test. I pretty much just say to myself, what is the data saying to me? What's the shortest term I, I'm comfortable with? What's the longest term I'm comfortable with? And so I find those two parameters and I trade things in between. And I just uh, don't really uh, have a, a great deal of respect for back testing anyways. I just try to get a basic idea of what has worked in the past. I cross my fingers. I hope that's what's gonna work in the future. But I know the markets are gonna be different and crazy and things we've never seen before are going to happen. So I try not to convince myself that I should pay too much attention to uh, the data, the historical data. I need to find a good place to buy and a pretty good place to sell, a stop loss that is reasonable, and then hope for the best. And that has really worked out well for me. I, do the, I don't optimize and... Um, any more than that. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you deal with say correlation risk? So for example, we saw March when, you know, every uh, safe haven like gold or bonds also went down. And, you know, in general, say if you're, if you're short the dollar, you know, that's sort of an implicit bet on being long emerging markets because emerging markets go up and the dollar goes down. So how do you go about, you know, thinking about the risk of, you know, markets, which are pretty correlated these days? Yes, I mean, they're correlated sometimes and then they're not correlated. The correlations are not stable usually. I try not to, to um, 
to think that either one of those scenarios will continue. It's, it's, I, I want to be prepared for the change in correlations. Mm -hmm. So I basically just, I've looked at the correlations. I think um, I don't, I, I, I'm happy and I'm appreciative of diversification and trading currencies, commodities, stocks, and bonds, and especially short trades. But I don't really think I'm going to rely upon those relationships uh, always being uncorrelated or being correlated even. Because I've seen situations where, uh, for instance, heating oil and crude oil and unleaded gas, most of the time they're 90% correlated. But I have seen a few times over the years where the correlation is zero and heating oil made a lot of money and crude and heat, unleaded did not. So you kind of want to have it both ways. You want to have some diversification and uh, be happy with that diversification, but know at any point in time that all the markets can become very correlated. So your only defense might be to reduce positions pretty quickly like we did last February, March. And then you need to be prepared for situations where all of a sudden very correlated markets are not correlated. And so you don't want to miss a big trend uh, in 1987, silver doubled in price and gold sort of sat there. And so these unexpected things, that's what trend followers are for. We are dumb enough to stay in stocks um, when valuations are too high and the trend keeps going up. We, we stay in our long bonds when interest rates are approaching zero. So the trend followers are there to make money on opportunities that we've never seen before. Okay. And you don't want to lose that characteristic. Yep, yeah, got it. How do you go about identifying a trend, you know, early enough so that you can get into it? That's a good question. You know, um, the trends, uh, obviously we need to see some strength and then we buy, we see some weakness and then we sell. I prefer breakouts you know, the 100 day high, the 150 day high, something like that. And um, likewise on the exits, you know, the 100 day low, the 150 day low, something like that. And I love the breakouts. And, uh, you know, sometimes the hundred, it sounds expensive to buy the highest price in the past 100 days. And then a few months later, you made a lot of money the market's gone a long <laughs> way. And you say, well, that was a pretty good price. <laughs> so. A lot of times, you know, we're set up from the very beginning to, when we make, put those trades on, to have a predetermined stop loss where we risk 50 basis points of our AUM or 100 basis points of our AUM. And so um, as important as the entry is, because you've got to get those trades on. And every trader has missed a big trade. They thought about doing it. They were supposed to do it. They don't do it. They look back. Uh, all the profit that they could have made, they didn't make because we have the stop loss. And so taking the trade should be the easiest decision. If I don't take it, I'm gonna, I possibly could miss a big trend. If I do take it, I'll lose, I'll take a small loss. So it is very important to take the trade. That's the number one rule. But, uh, and we make it easier on ourselves because we're gonna limit that loss to a small loss. So uh, I love the breakouts. Move, some people use the moving average crossovers. Uh, I think it's important to note that, yeah, you do, trend following traditionally has a 40% win rate. 60% of the trades are losers, but the losers are small. And um, you never know what these markets are going to do. If you have to take 10 losers in a row, that's fine. Yeah, got it. What's sort of your time horizon, you know, for writing a trend? You know, you said at the start that you, these days you've got to be more long-term thinking than you were, you know, when you were uh, working with Richard Dennis. So what's, what's your time horizon like? Well, my time horizon is going to be determined by looking at the back test and histor historically what's going on mm -hmm. in the markets. And the first question I would ask myself is, I look at some charts and look at some long-term charts and look at some big trends and see to say to myself, what time frame does it look like I need to have in order to maximize my profit on these trends? And then I would run it, I'd run a back test and see if I, you know, see how close I was 
and usually I can get pretty close. So unfortunately, that's a, a you know a one year look back or a six month look back. So it's it's longer term than I used to trade, and the drawdowns can be fairly large on that type of a look back. But look, you have to go with the back test and the research and, and the history of what has worked. And these sort of medium to long term trend following systems, they've always worked and they've worked better than the shorter term as far as making money. But, you know, a trader should desire to trade as short term as possible because that just means the drawdowns and the, you know, the profit gives backs, give backs will be lower. But we have to do what the data tells us. And I can't trade too short term because uh, the, the old turtle systems, uh, I don't think they make money anymore. They haven't made money for a while. So, you know, it's a, it's a trade-off. Do you want to make money? Then you have to lengthen your look back. And that seems like a, a decent trade-off to me. I prefer to make money. Got it. And how do you decide, you know, when a trend is over? So, you know, you've got, you've got the trade on. You know, it doesn't hit your stop button. You know, the market starts to trend higher. And when do you decide, you know, a trend is over? Does that, you know, completely depend on your algorithm or on your back test? Oh, yes, it is. It's totally dependent upon the back test. So in the same way, I'm looking at entries. I'm also looking at exits. And I'm allowing the computer to sort of go through different parameter iterations and tell me, you know, what, what, what looks good, what has worked uh, as far as making money and, keeping money, keeping your money. So yeah, it's, and then we're looking at all of the data and we're looking at all of the trades, the longs and the shorts, we're combining them together to come up with a good average uh, breakout level. And then we're looking at all the markets. We're not uh, looking at, a, we don't have a currency system or a bond system or a commodity system or a grain system. We have one system that is what works best on all of the markets, the longs and the shorts. And so we're saying to ourselves, if we trade this uh, for the rest of our life, we stay disciplined, then if the markets are similar to the past, we should make money. And we live in this world like where we're very concerned about today. And these trades that I have on, I just said that these trades I have on now are some of the most profitable trades I've ever had in my entire career. And I don't want to give back too much profit. But in order to follow the system, I am at the mercy of those system exits. And I'm really interested in these trades, although the trend following strategy says, you know, don't be interested in these trades or the last trades or the next trades. You're interested in all of the trades. And if you want to maximize your wealth over your, the rest of your life, you should trade, you should do these trades the way the systems call for these trades. So it's very difficult because we don't want to, we want to make as much money today and this year as possible. It's very stressful. And I think to some degree, because it is like this and it, and it does um, do what the math will tell you to do without regard to anything else, today's profits, this month's profits, this month's returns, what your clients want, what you would prefer, then I think it has a long, a lifespan into the future because it's really not the way anyone would desire uh, to manage money. And do you exist, do they have say like a price target that you look to hit before you get out or how do, how do your exits work? Do you, do you tend to say scale out of a trade to, you know, after the trade is up 50%, you know, you remove half your risk and you left and then you let half, uh, you know, your position continue running. How does that work? No, like I said, I would just uh, buy the breakout, the 100-day high, and then sell the 100-day low. And so until the 100-day low or whatever my exit uh, is on the, the breakout exit, I ignore, you know, how big the profit was. Or, and I don't do profit objectives. And I don't scale back based upon uh, the volatility in the market. I scale my positions on entry mm -hmm. inversely to the volatility but then once it turns into a profit and keeps going, I just let it go. It's very um, scary sometimes because some of these trades have been so big, lumber, Bitcoin. It's been a bad week and, or two for lumber and Bitcoin, my two biggest trades. So you're calling me at a good time. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really unhappy with my strategy. Uh, but you know, uh, 
I've seen it before where, you know, the market sells off, you don't get out and it keeps going and you really lose a lot of money back or the market turns around and goes off to new highs and keeps going. So we do what we do because it has worked in the past and maybe it won't work on these trades, but I've done it the other way where I've tried to use discretion and uh, emotions and it's been worse. And, you know, when you say that, you know, when you talk about your lumber or Bitcoin and, you know, Bitcoin this week is down quite a bit. So how do you stop yourself from, you know, say interfering with the algorithm and, you know, just allowing the algorithm to do what it does? And uh, how do you like stop yourself from, you know, at your discretion, overriding the algorithm? Well, thankfully, I've never had success overriding my system. I've always been punished. So I have no, no good memories. I have a lot of bad memories of overriding my system. I think another key is to not watch performance too closely. You know, it's a, hypo, it's a, it's a theoretical experience you have going on here. I'm gonna follow the system. I'm gonna be happy with the returns. I'm gonna be happy with all the characteristics of this wonderful uh, rules-based system I have. I'm gonna tell myself that all the time and um, but what makes it easier is having seen success and having success, which I've had, uh, I've seen a lot of uh, benefits of following the systems and then trading small or trading a size that allows you not to have too much anxiety and tempts you to override the system. So some people can trade larger than me but if I have a big drawdown and 20 or 30% drawdown, me personally, I would be more prone to override. But if I trade smaller and I have a 10% drawdown or 12%, 15% drawdown, then I'm more, I'm more able to hang in there with my system and do the right thing and not override it. So I think that people should try to pursue the best possible ways of trading. And I don't think it should necessarily fit your personality. I'm sure you've interviewed people and they would say, find something that suits your personality. Well, this type of trading certainly doesn't suit my personality. I would like to make 1% a month, all the, every month, or maybe 2% a month. So I, don't, I think it's asking a lot from the markets to say, give me the money and make it suit my personality. So I, and I don't think we should think that way. I think we should say there are good ways of trading. There are better ways of trading. I'm going to spend the rest of my life trying to find the best ways. There is objectively a better way possibly. I'm maybe making some mistakes. Um, and so the pursuit, but, but a lot of people tell me all the time, like there's no better, there's no best way. Uh, you do your thing, I'll do my thing. I think that that might be possible, but I don't want to think that way. I want to hold myself to a higher standard and try to find better ways, best ways, uh, best practices and improve and learn. And although I will say, choose the, uh, the leverage and the volatility that does make you sleep well at night, that allows you to follow the system. That I will say, if you can uh, try to make 50% a year with 50 to 70% drawdowns, then go for it. If you're okay with that, then go for it. If you need to have very low volatility with a five or 10% drawdown, that's, that's you, that's fine. But uh, that, uh, that's the only thing I'll give into is following your personality. Uh, traits, you know, I, I need to trade relatively small and so I can sleep well at night and not be too uptight and try to override my systems. And, you know, when you say that, you know, you're, so you're supposed to sit there, find, you know, the best kind of trading system that works. I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, people who you say, you know, discretionary technical analysis, because in general, you know, systematic or quantitative traders tend to usually be, you know, critical of, you know, people who use discretionary technical analysis. So you know, what are your thoughts? What do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, Trading should be systematic and should be rules-based and based upon a historical back test. And one of the criteria and requirements for trading this strategy is to 
the have rules that you can execute and be 100% consistent with those rules. I don't think what we do it can be haphazardly implemented, or I see a pattern, or I'm a trend follower today. I'm going to combine my trend following with my discretion or fundamentals. But I don't think that that's something that I could recommend. Um, I don't know anything about value trading or discretionary trading, really. I, I assume that a lot of discretionary traders um, have rules. And I think they probably have less ability uh, due to people that they work for to have drawdowns like I do. So they have to do some suboptimal things in order to stay employed. <laughs> so that's the stories I've heard. Uh, so I feel bad for them. So, but I think that looking at patterns and looking at trend today or the market's up and I'm gonna be a trend follower, take a small loss. I think these are good cliches and their ideas, but they all need to be packaged into a, a turnkey systematic approach that you are going to implement every single day. Everything, every decision is a rule. It's been back tested. And so it's much different than, um, I, I'll be critical of everything pretty much that doesn't do it that particular way. Um, although I do understand that there are other ways of trading that I know nothing about. So I'm not gonna be critical uh, about that because of things I don't know anything about. But um, I don't, I'm not a fan of technical analysis because that's much different than a systematic trend following with rules. Yeah, yeah, you know, I was curious because you know, people who do, who do follow, you know, quantitative strategies, they, you know, they're usually, you know, stringent on the fact that everything should be, you know, testable, everything should be falsifiable. And, you know, it's impossible to say test a head and shoulders pattern because that tends to be at the discretion uh, of the person who's trading it. You know, I might see a pattern, but that, that you might not. And, you know, that ends up, you know, causing problems. I think another thing that happens too, I know this is not a really popular thing to say, but I think it's um, shocking how long people can be lucky. <laughs> so I think a lot of discretionary people are lucky if they're in the game for a long period of time without strict risk control rules, taking small losses, diversifying. You can get away with a lot of bad ideas if you limit the losses, diversify, not just with stocks, but currencies, commodities, bonds, stocks. Um, do shorts, you know, I think you can get away with a lot of sketchy ideas with good sort of risk management, risk controls, reducing your, uh, your portfolio when you lose money. And that'll, but I think by and large, it's shocking how long well people can be lucky and do things they shouldn't do. Then all of a sudden, they no longer, the, the firm no longer exists. So this happens a lot and it's happened recently. And I remember hearing about a very famous firm that went out of business and I started reading about this firm and I went and listened to two hours of a podcast of years ago. <clears throat> and I listened to this podcast. They did not use stop losses. And I had to wade through two hours of this boring stuff that they talked about, genius people. Oh my God, way smarter than me. And I got to the critical part. They added to losing trades. They added to losing trades. And I called up the guy, my friend who did the podcast. He interviewed these, this guy. And I'm like, hey, did you, did you, I went back and listened to two hours of your old podcast. And the guy admitted to adding to losing positions. And I was like, there you go. And so how long did this firm last? By when something went against them, the value people, you know, if it goes against me, it's now it's a better value. <laughs> <laughs> so this works until it stops working. Because I have to tell you, when I get out of a trade and it goes against me and I take a small loss, the odds are I have to get right back in it at a worse price. So yeah. I'm wrong. So it was totally unnecessary almost all the time. Almost all the time. So the market is out there. And if you have these chinks in your armor, these flaws, 
if you have a problem, Achilles heel, it may take a long time before you get hurt really bad because I've had those and I have had really bad periods where I was just over trading, trading too large. I had something about my system that was over optimized and I got into a bad situation. So we all do it, the trend followers with uh, all the diversification, the longs and the shorts, taking the small losses. They just have a tendency to have very uh, normal average performance, uh, but that's uh, but it also helps them survive a long time. Got it. Got it. You know, when you were uh, when you were working with Richard Dennis, you know, you said that you know, you know the people there and uh, you know you you all would aim for say two hundred percent a year, but then you know that's not true today. So how did that evolve, and you know how has that evolved? Uh, the, the so how uh, much you risk or uh, well, yeah, know, position yeah. sizing? Right, right. So, you know, one of the great things about the turtle program was not just the rules and the knowledge and the fact that we were working for um, these genius people. I mean, Rich and Bill were just genius. And I had never met human beings like this before. They're the nicest people on the planet and way nicer to me uh, than they should have been. And, uh, but it was not just that, it was the experience and them uh, telling us, here are the rules. And your bottom line is to do the right thing, follow the rules. If you follow the rules and lose money, that'll be fine. But if you make money, you'd be in trouble. And so having those four years of just being encouraged and we had bad drawdowns and they would come in and say, okay, you've had this bad drawdown. You are um, losing lots of money, but here's more money. Here's more money. Start trading larger now. And uh, the markets would be great. And we make 200%. So this is just not a real um, scenario that people, the traders face. The clients are always complaining. It's, they're never happy. They, they want you to not follow your system. And in fact, if you ask them, do you want me to follow the system and do the right thing by my system? Or do you want me to guess? And if guessing helped me make more money, oh, they would all say, make more money. Just guess, we don't care. Get out of that trade. Oh, I, oh many, many times I've had big profits in trades and they would encourage me to not wait for my system, and not wait for my rule, rules-based exit. So. Uh, in the good times and the bad times, being uh, uh, mentored by people who encouraged you to follow the math, follow the numbers, uh, uh, do what the system tells you to do, this is invaluable over time. And so we had a lot of confidence and our whole goal was just to uh, make Rich happy. He was the greatest guy ever. So we were so loyal and we loved him and we love this opportunity. So we had all kinds of confidence. And his, um, his idea was make 200%. <laughs> so that's what we wanted to do. But when 1988 rolls around, I wasn't uh, stupid. So I knew that I didn't have Rich as a client anymore. And I had normal uh, clients. Mm -hmm. And so I had to reduce my trading size and trade smaller and maybe try to make 20%. And I felt so guilty. I, re I remember that first trade that I did for Chesapeake. And I remember trading so small, going, I'm so glad Rich is not here to see this. He'd be so, <laughs> so embarrassed. <laughs> <laughs> so we absolutely had the smartest. Um, these guys were the best mentors in every way. Um, so gentle and nurturing because we were screwing up and not following the rules and uh, being afraid to put the trades on. At least I was. And they were so nice to us. And they were so, uh, you know, before their time as it relates to math and computers and back testing and training us on the philosophy of how to uh, trade, how to do back tests, how to think about the markets in general and preparing us that we were not going to be able to just use these systems, but we had to think about ways to evolve over time as the markets changed. It could not have been better. And uh, 
I think the turtles were way more suited and trained to uh, have small funds and trade their own money and not have big businesses because I think trading, uh, the trading business and raising assets is very different than proper trading. 100% proper trading is not something that clients like. <laughs> <laughs> now, I think Renaissance, you know, that's a different ballgame. There's always an exception. Renaissance and some of these other people, they've cracked the code. But for the vast majority of us, um, it's very difficult to hold the line on doing things the proper way and raising a lot of money. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, the thing is that clients tend to usually want, you know, the rich, I, I, I remember reading, you know, the clients usually want, you know, the return of stocks with the volatility of bonds. And, you know, that's, that's, that's just not achievable. So <laughs> are you ever, are you ever sort of, you know, fully invested or do you always aim to sort of keep a certain percent of your assets in cash? Uh, well, um, the fund, the trend following fund is more than fully invested. <laughs> <laughs> it's futures. We trade a lot of markets that have low volatility. So we leverage those markets up. We trade markets that have high volatility, like the stocks. We leverage them down and trade them smaller. So the typical CPA with a you know a million dollar uh, account or is, is 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 controlling five to ten million dollars worth of assets. So we're more than fully invested. Uh, you know, there's there's a the, trading uh, the CTA in, in the futures markets. It's like driving a Ferrari. It can go 20 miles an hour. It can also go 150, 200 miles an hour. So it just depends on, you have the full discretion on how much you want to push that pedal down. Uh, we have always, we have plenty of cash to put on the exact position that we want. Got it, got it. One of the statements that you made in your interview with Marit Seibert of Real Vision was that, you know, you said that you think that single stocks are much better than indices. So could you, could you explain why and, you know, how, how, uh, you know, why that's true? Diversification, you know, in a nutshell, um, I can go out and find 20 stocks that I want to trade that I can choose the stocks. I don't, I don't have to trade a thousand, but I can tr find 20, 25 or 50 stocks to trade and choose uh, stocks from different industries and different correlations and uh, versus 20 indices that are cap weighted and that are fairly correlated. I looked at all those indices today, Europe, Asia, US, Canada, and mm -hmm they were all, they all look similar to me. And of course they all crashed. And the problem is, you see with, with single stocks in, in February of last year, I was flat some and I was short some. Mm -hmm. And I was long a lot. And so when they all crashed, so when the market crashed, they all went down, but I wasn't long everything. And so right now, and then last February, then we were long all those stocks. And so there was no diversification. We'll have a chance, a possibility at diversification uh, if we trade the single names. And it's so critical for CTA trend following to have diversification. CTAs over the years have made a huge mistake by only trading futures markets and not branching out into single names. We preach diversification and how important it is to trade uh, lots of different markets. And yet we don't trade cash equities. Why? And we would get so much more credit for doing it. We'd be a normal hedge fund almost. We'd be a, a, a macro, a, a, you know, kind of a systematic macro. And um, so it makes no sense whatsoever that we don't do it. And um, the chances of an outlier trade and getting a hold of something that's going to have a crazy move is much higher in an individual name than an index, which is an average. Uh, CTAs would never trade the dollar index only. I've oh, got too many great currencies, 20, over 20 or 30 currencies to trade. We'd never trade the Goldman Sachs commodity index versus uh, grains and metals and energy and softs. And mm -hmm. we trade every single one of those. So why yeah. do we choose indexes? 
makes no sense and it needs to stop. But I, you know, I'm one of the few traders doing it and if it's a huge edge for me. So I, I'm, you know, why should I encourage other people to, to do something they already know they should do? It makes no sense. You should ask, I'll be, uh, you should ask somebody who trades indices why they do it. Uh, and I'll be sure to watch. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be sure to send it to you as well. <laughs> I've said this so many times and no one has ever criticized me. I'm, it's like I'm trying to get someone to, to set me straight. Okay, Jerry, here's the reason. You don't, you don't need to trade individual stocks, but I can't get anyone to do that. <laughs> but then, you know, single stocks, uh, you know, for example, if, you know, there's a news of, say, a short report or, you know, something more common, say, you know, there's earnings every quarter, do you, do you usually size for those kind of moves, uh, you know, at the, at the start? So, you know, you just risk lesser or are there any other ways that you go about dealing with those kind of risks? Well, I, you know, look, I, I'll run some calculations, not too intense, not too deep, but I'll, for instance, my, it's pretty common sense, um, I'll trade the grains and the metals and the energy and the softs and the meats and the currencies and the bonds and the stocks. So that's like seven or eight different sectors. And so that means stocks will be about 15% of my portfolio. And so it's small, small, you know, stocks and grains are going to be about the same stocks and uh, energy about the same stocks and metals about the same. Okay. So I'm helping myself there that the whole stock sector cr gets crushed. It's 15 or 20%. Yeah. Now stocks of all the different sectors, it's like too many to choose from. You can trade 20 or 50. And if, you tr if your portfolio is 15 or 20% stocks and you're gonna trade 50 stocks, I mean, each one of these positions is so small. I mean, none of them, if the stock goes to zero and you can't get out, it's barely gonna matter. And so you need a preponderance of these markets to have a big trend in order to make money, in order to get hurt. If they all crash against you, yeah, okay, you'll probably get hurt in the stock market. But in order to protect yourself, from uh, uh, earnings and uh, events that stocks go through where they really lose a lot of, uh, have one day uh, bad periods, bad, bad days, uh, stocks are the easiest to protect yourself against. Um, it's kind of like the same thing that happened in the Swiss franc four or five years ago where it had a huge move yeah. down, just the biggest move ever, you know? And so, you know, I trade 20 or 25 currencies. So thankfully uh, the Swiss was small. So I think that's the situation I want to be in. What does it take to make money? Oh, it takes a lot of good trends in that sector or in that group or in the whole portfolio, maybe. Okay, then what does it take to lose money? The exact same thing. It has to be really bad. A lot of things have to start going wrong. And I want to, do, I want to be there. I know what my edge is. I can measure my edge. I can do the back test. I know my average trade is three times as large as my average loss. My average win is three times as large as my average loss. That's a good bet. And it's betting. Don't let anyone confuse you and try to tell you it's not betting. If they're not betting, then they have this negative skew. They're, they're going to get crushed in a big stock sell-off or some sort of sell-off. So that's the great thing about the CTAs. We know exactly what the numbers say and the numbers are really good in our favor. Although sometimes it doesn't look like it and you just have to keep punching away and doing, doing what you should do so you can uh, get these good markets like we've had over the past six months. And in markets, like in, in commodities, it's another thing. We totally disregard, at least I do, classic trend following totally disregards recent performance. So the, the commodities have been bad. Probably the worst of the commodities was the grains. Now this year, they're the best. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do not pay attention to short-term um, performance, you know, and the past five or 10 years has been really bad in the grains. And so you're saying that's short-term and I'm saying, yeah, unfortunately that's kind of short-term. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Um, 
So, you know, uh, there are many traders today, uh, you know, even successful ones say that, you know, your edge is sort of in, uh, you know, your psychology and in your risk management, as opposed to, you know, in your entry and your exit system. So, you know, to what degree do you agree with that? I think it's one and the same, you know, um, the, the entries and the exit are totally based on the psychology of people not wanting to buy highs and sell lows people not wanting to take small losses, people not wanting to let profits turn into losses. Most people don't want to let a big, huge profit <laughs> turn into a small profit or a smaller profit. And so I think that the, the whole trend following mentality of taking small losses and letting your profits run is um, not what people want to do. It's counterintuitive, but it works. We wish that it didn't work, but it does work because we people don't like it. And built into trade following is this inherent risk control of taking small losses, of trading lots of markets, which is not, not a lot of stocks, but lots of different markets, and doing shorts. Sometimes shorts really help. And you mentioned March of last year, February of last year. That was the key, is to realize all hell was breaking loose. And if you were going to override your systems, that was a good time to do it. And that would be to reduce your, your leverage, reduce your positions. Everything was losing. Uh, your whole game, goal in this whole game is to stay alive, is to survive. And so getting out of your longs, currency longs, bond longs, stock longs, every long, getting short the stocks and the commodities and the currencies as quickly as possible with classic trend following that did not mess around and hesitate and wait for something, sell that breakout as quickly as you can, that worked like golden. And it's not going to get any better than that. The only thing better than that was 2008. Uh, yeah. 2008 and last year, amazing how the only thing that was going, the best thing that was going to help you is selling those breakouts as quickly as possible. And that's what the CTAs did. And a lot of those trades didn't really work out that well. They kind of over time went back up. But then we were all poised for last October when all the good things started to happen. <laughs> Got it, yeah. And you know, when you're when you're a trend follower, they tend, uh, they, there tends to be sort of extended periods of drawdowns, and you know, in general, they do tend uh, there uh, there there are periods of drawdowns for you know any kind of trading strategy that are not only steep, they're also long. And you know, how do you go about coping with these, you know, psychologically? And you know, how do you go about coping with the? Uh, how do you go about actually recovering from these kind of drawdowns? You know, I don't know if anybody's asking so many good questions. <laughs> The really good questions because Thank I'm you. getting out a lot of good stuff that I think is good. You know, maybe no one else will, but this, these are really, uh, you're really getting to some really good topics here. So Thank you. I think the, it's very important to realize that I, I'm not in favor of cliches necessarily. I think a lot of trading cliches are incorrect. Um, um, you can't go broke taking profits. Uh, obviously you can't. Um, but I think that the, the trend following cliche of taking small losses and letting profits run is really a good cliche. It works. And so what we're doing, though, when you think about it, is we're, is we're saying, let's be very concerned with these small losses and in, in the capital in our account. We want to risk 50 basis points uh, or 100 basis points, something sort of small. But if we have a profit, and, oh my gracious, we will risk hundreds of basis points. We will risk, you know, who knows how many basis points until our uh, breakout exit gets hit. So just having that in your head that you've, you've taken all of this risk and this volatility and moved it from your capital and your initial investment into the most profitable trades. So we're going to have all of this crazy volatility when we're making money. Oh, could not be better, you know, because I don't like losing money. And when I'm, when I have a, when someone gives me a million dollars to manage, I don't like it when it's at 900,000. I do not like that. 
I don't want it to get to 900,000. I'm losing, I've had a lot of losing trades then. But if that goes to uh, from 1 million to 2 million, and the 2 million goes back to a million and a half, wonderful. You know, I want that big drawdown to come when we we're making money. And it's two entirely different things. And so I keep track of that capital, that uh, initial investment plus the realized profits and losses. And I want to make sure that that is, I'm very good at preserving that capital. But in order to make big money, um, the computer, the back test, my common sense is telling me, do not be uh, as concerned about these profitable trades. You're going to take small losses. You're going to make less money. I'm sorry, you're going to take small profits. You're going to make less money if you get too concerned about these winning trades in the same way that you're concerned with the losing trades. And so this is this gift that trend following gives you. And yet so many people, so many uh, large trend followers over the uh, past 20 years have totally uh, screwed it all up and introduced this idea that volatility matters, standard deviation matters. And so let's get out of some of these very profitable trades before the trend has turned around because the volatility is high. Wrong, bad. <laughs> <laughs> so that's another problem with rules-based trading. People think it's a rule. Mm -hmm. You cannot criticize me if it's a rule. And I'm saying, no, I will criticize you. It's a bad rule. Yeah. So what if you have a rule? Your rule stinks. I don't like it. It doesn't have a good sample size. It's making you take small profits by the fact that you're not hanging on to the profits as long as you could with a traditional trend following system. You have to trade larger, risk more. So right. now you've switched the risk back to the capital account. Instead of risking 50 basis points, you have to risk 75 basis points because your winning trades are smaller than mine. So it's a road to nowhere. And uh, I talk so bad about this all the time. For 20 years, I have talked bad about this and no one criticizes. No one, everyone just ignores me. <laughs> uh, we, need to do, we need to do one of these uh, podcasts with a, with a different trader. So the trader and I, who, who trades differently, who likes to vol target and and pay attention to, vol to standard deviation, to volatility, and doesn't trade single stocks. And so, <laughs> someone I could argue with. It's much. It's it's a, it's a lot of fun to do that. It would be. It would be fun to host a you know, Jerry Parker, you know, versus <laughs> someone debate. Exactly. Well, you know, for it to be a fair fight, you may have to get five people against me. So, we'll... <laughs> I'm joking. To wrap up the podcast, I wanted to ask you, you know, how would you go about pursuing a career in trading today? You know, you don't, you know, today you don't have, say, you know, Richard Dennis kind of figure. You, you don't have, say, bank prop dust anymore, especially after 2008. I know the so-called macro funds have sort of been bleeding over the last decade. So how would you, you know, if you had to start today, what would you go about doing? Well, honestly, I think that I would uh, recommend to some degree, you know, basically you have to be flexible and go with the flow, but I would pretty much recommend doing exactly what I did. Number one, I was 100% prepared. Um, you know, I could have been a broker in my hometown, a stock broker, and obviously had a really good break uh, seeing an ad in the Wall Street Journal and working for Richard Dennis and Bill Eckhart. Um, smart people, but the smartest, the best. Um, but I was prepared. So are you prepared? Get prepared. Uh, find a passion. Find something that you're interested in as it relates to trading. Is it, is it trend following or is it something else? Then do the best you can. Become an expert. Read as much as you can. I was a voracious reader. And this was before the internet. Now it's so much easier. Go out there and, and find interviews of people that you admire and strategies that you want to emulate. And then number two, uh, critical uh, point number two is find a mentor. And that is critical. Uh, mm -hmm. Find a mentor, uh, volunteer to, you know, get their, pick up their dry cleaning and mow their yard or something. 
just find somebody that you can work with and help and let them know that your bottom line is to, uh, to help them. You have no agenda except to learn and, uh, to, uh, and then be eager to learn. And so many young people today have their own opinions. Uh, you know, Richard Dennis said, I could print in the newspaper, I could run an ad in the newspaper with my rules, put my rules in the newspaper and people wouldn't follow them. And I think what he meant uh, 30 years ago was people wouldn't have the discipline to follow them. But I think what, he, what, what it means to me now is people would argue with you about it. People would argue and say, who are you? <laughs> what do you know? I have a better idea. I can do yeah. my own back test. <laughs> so right. it's laughable. Uh, and so people today are usually not that uh, amenable to learning from others and, uh, and being patient and saying, hey, this may take five years or 10 years before I get my break, but make your bottom line learning and then maybe you'll get lucky and somebody will meet you and say, hey, here's a million dollars, here's five million, here's 10 million. You know, what's a what's million dollars today in uh, 1983 terms? Maybe it's 50 million, maybe you'll get 50 million. You can start your own trading in your own business. Mm -hmm. To some degree, that should be the least of your concern. If you, you should be able to impress somebody with your knowledge and your passion to where the money, you'll get the money. I got the money when I left Chesapeake. And, uh, but I think at least two thirds of that is easily doable. Um, and just be patient. You know, everybody is very, I was impatient, but be patient, find, find somebody who will tutor, tutor you and be your mentor and um, be willing to learn and listen from other people. Um, mm -hmm. That's exactly what I did. And it's a great business. It's so much fun. And it's just fantastic to be uh, every day. I sit at this desk right here and I'm just watching the world unfold in front of me with all these markets. And uh, intellectually, it's fascinating. Plus it's really intellectually stimulating to compete against the rest of the world. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And, you know, the market sort of also decides the winner. So, you know, everyone has sort of, you know, the same game master in a sense. So, yeah. With that, thank you so much for being on the podcast, Jerry. It was awesome having you. Thanks for having me, Shree. It's so much fun. Congratulations on, on uh, what you've built so far. And I look forward to meeting you in person one of these days. Absolutely. Thank you.